intern and I lead a center within the business school called the Urbanization Project. So there's a, there's a mixture of serendipity in almost all uh, discoveries and new lines of investigation, but then there's also a kind of a timing. There, there comes a point where something is, is uh, uh, it, the time is right to explore it. I was exposed to evolutionary thinking when I visited at the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences at a time when John Tooby and Lita Cosmides and uh, Martin Daly and uh, Margot Wilson were there. Uh, Jeff Miller was a graduate student at that time. Bob Frank was around. I had been reading Bob's work. So it was just a you know, fortuitous exposure. But the reason the timing was right for me is because I had been looking at long-run growth, which is driven partly by technology. The leading edge countries, new technologies are what spawns growth. But if you look at countries which are lagging behind and where, like countries today, where they still don't have access to 100-year-old technologies like efficient electric light in the home, there's got to be something else which is holding back the spread of technologies. And it's something which economists talk about as, well, it's political economy, it's maybe norms, it's culture. So I wanted to take the economic kind of model of behavior and create a richer model so that I could start to understand the political and cultural dynamics which in many countries uh, would impede the adoption of technologies that could have helped everybody. I, I had a small hand too in, uh, I, was help, I was a co-leader with Herb Gintis of a group that was funded by the MacArthur Foundation on preferences. So it's taking the model of preferences that comes out of economics and enriching it in ways that people are talking about today. So like the work that Joe Heinrich did was partly funded by the, uh, right, that group. So I had a little, uh, a little hand in that. Uh... Well, I, I think the most interesting thing is that around the time, this is around uh, 1999, 2000, around the time that I was, say, working with the, the preference group, uh, the MacArthur preference group, behavioral economics was just coming on scene. And what that was, was the kind of the, the importation into economics of a line of research from psychology led by Kahneman and Tversky and many others. And it was, it was very descriptive but it, it wasn't systematized in a way that led to a good interface with economics. So there was a lot of attention to anomalies and a collection of behaviors that were just, oh, isn't this interesting? But there was not a coherent theoretical structure that could, could interface with the structure we use in economics. Mm -hmm. And what excited me at the time about evolutionary psychology was that it gave a little bit more theoretical coherence and also shifted the attention in the direction I thought was most interesting, which is not from, if you think of human, if they take that standard economic model of extremely, extremely sophisticated uh, reasoning and very simple preferences, meat versus uh, vegetables or something, the right direction, I think, is you can turn down the sophistication of intelligence and point to anomalies and you know the, the cognitive limits and reasoning, but then to explain the very sophisticated behavior that humans engage in, you've got to turn up the sophistication of our preferences. So we're, we're, we have state variables that change how we feel about even the food items we consume. We learn from others how to feel about things like food, but also how to feel like what's a morally appropriate act in, in any particular group. So the, the behavioral economics wave, I think, had to have its chance to influence economics. But what's happening now is this I think more theoretically sophisticated line of work that's also thinking more about the preference moral side of uh, decision making and de-emphasizing the role of the conscious explicit cognition. Well, it, in, in some sense, the biggest question of all, the one that's always interested me, is what drives progress? So, Technology is clearly a part of that, and that was what I worked on in the early part of my career. But it's, it's very clear that there's something that I would call rules that have to co-evolve with progress. 
so that every new technology we get, like internal combustion engines, you got to have rules about stopping at stoplights or don't block the box that make sure they use those technologies in a way which is which is beneficial. So the the key is to understand the kind of the coevolution of technologies and rules. And then I think you have to split rules into something like laws, which are the things that economists typically pay attention to, where change in laws comes through a political process, but where there is also this other dimension of the rules which is instantiated in our norms. Our norms do change over time, and we need to understand how the norms influence the laws, and, and uh, both and the laws influence the norms, how those together can influence either the development of new technologies or the spread of technologies. And what's, you know, what's exciting here is I think the, uh, a, a variety of people coming from various different perspectives who are all zooming in on this part of the human psyche, the normative moral dimension that is strongly influenced by social phenomenon and that this is the thing which I think will inform our vision of political economy, group decision making, and, and will lead us to think about new dimensions for, for progress. Like instead of just having a better institution for the nation as a whole to pass new laws, you can think about creating new, in the biological terms, super organisms that can bring people together and have those super organisms compete with each other. I think this is what the capitalist market system did in creating businesses as super organisms that compete with each other very intensely. I'm suggesting that I think in political jurisdictions we could have more competition below the level of the nation if we empowered cities to adopt independent policies and compete for people, compete for providing a high, a high quality of life, and then that competition plays out partly with mobility of people, but partly with copying what the most successful cities are doing. But one other thing that I think is very interesting is it's, it's very useful to think of all of us now as belonging to many different communities. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a physical, say, city in which we reside, but we can belong to the, you know, the Apple community or the Wintel community. We can work in a firm like NYU and we're part of the academic community. There, there's all kinds of different communities that we can opt into or opt out of and they compete with each other and provide different kinds of services. And so competition between these multiple overlapping uh, kinds of super organisms or groups or however you want to describe them, I think is a, is a very exciting way to think about how humans as a species will continue to make, make yeah, progress. You can think of the new city as like a new context where you can select people and encourage new norms. But even, even within a city, many people have noticed how the metro in Delhi in India has been able to sustain some new norms about just being polite with respect to women, not, not you know, doing things like spitting or littering in the, the cars. So a new space can be interesting precisely because it creates this new context in which new norms, particular norms, can, can be activated.